So, um, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and we are on chapter 4, and today's reading is from verse 17 through to verse 32. And Paul writes this, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus." that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And do not, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Can we thank God for his word? So we're going to go through this passage bit by bit to see what the Lord is saying to us. And so we begin in verse 17, where Paul wrote, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Everyone say, in the Lord. So in other words, what he's saying here, the Lord backs him up. Okay, this is from the Lord, these instructions. So he says, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, that is the nations, the non-Jews, walk in the futility of their minds. So basically he's saying, listen, don't follow the crowd. Okay? It's very, very simple. But yet, it is something that many Christians do. You know, we want to fit in, want to be, you know, cool, want to be relevant, but we're not supposed to follow the crowd, okay? He says, don't walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So our lifestyle is to be different than the world, amen? Now, why does he say this? He says, because they walk in the futility of their mind. Now, why are their minds futile? Well, the answer is in the next verse, in verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. These are very kind words, aren't they? Now, he says that before we became to Christ, this is what we can glean from this, our understanding was darkened, every one of us. And we were ignorant about God and how he has called us to live. And consequently, we we were alienated from living a life in fellowship with God. Now, the last part of this verse speaks of the blindness of their hearts. Now, most translations read something like the hardness of their hearts. And that's because... That's what the Greek word means, hardness. And a hard heart 
How many of you remember Pharaoh? All right, that's a hard heart. He, he stubbornly refused to yield to God. And, you know, many of us in areas of our life stubbornly refuse to yield to God. I saw a quote. Um, I forget the name of the person. I have it in my head just how to pronounce it has left me. But basically, she said, hold all things lightly. Otherwise, it will hurt when God forces your hands open to let go. And uh, many times, because we don't listen, we have to feel. (laughs) And so it's just easier for you if you just, when God says something, just do it. Don't have to go through some long-winded thing to learn the lesson. (laughs) You see, we are to learn from our mistakes, aren't we? But I say it's better to learn from other people's mistakes. That's why we have the Bible. That's partly why we have the Bible. David, what happens? He's anointed by God. He's a powerful man after God's own heart, the king. Things are going well. Then Bathsheba happened. All right, and from that point on, it's downhill. It turns to a very sad picture of David. And thank God, God forgave him, but... His life went downhill from there. And so listen, you can, you know, go and do whatever sin it is and have to go through that long-winded process, or you could just do what God says. You could learn from other people's mistakes like David and avoid all of that. Amen? And I'm not saying that our lives will be easy if we do what is right. I am saying that, listen, you can save yourself a lot of hassle by just obeying God in the first place. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. Now, Paul continues in verse 19. He says, Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, note those two words, past feeling. Very important. We must never get to the point where we can no longer feel our conscience convicting us of certain sins. Can I hear a good amen? And you know me well enough by now, I don't just pick... I love going through books of the Bible like this because I can't pick, you know, popular topics. Ten steps to your breakthrough. You know, we go through this verse by verse, so we really... You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, we need the whole of Scripture, not just select parts. Every word. That's how he said, you will live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So listen, never just follow preachers who make you feel good. I'm not here to make you feel good. You know me well enough. I will preach the truth even if it meant 80% of you left and never came back. I'm sold out for God, amen? And that's just the way it is here. Now, he says, being past feeling. You see, the more we ignore our conscience, the more we refuse to listen to that voice telling us to obey God and to stop living in sin and stop doing that, the harder our hearts become. Until it gets to the point, as Paul said elsewhere, he said, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron. And a seared conscience is basically when, you know, you might get saved, and when you first get saved, you you know, all excited about God and you're living right, you're, you've changed the way you speak even, and then you might hear some other Christians gossiping. Now, you wouldn't do that because you're, you've been born again and your conscience, you know, won't feel good about that. But then you hear other Christians gossiping, speaking bad about someone behind their back. And then you think, well, maybe I'm a bit extreme. Maybe it is okay to do that. And each time you yield to that sin of gossiping, you know what happens? Eventually you get to the point where you no longer even hear your conscience pricking you when you gossip. That's what happens. This is being past feeling. And listen, we can live in sin habitually and not even feel any way about it. And that's a dangerous place. Paul says about these people, they are past feeling and have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, that's the result of when people harden their heart to God. They give themselves over to lewdness and all uncleanness. Now, regretfully, I have to say that this is the society we live in. That's given itself over to lewdness and 
uncleanness. And he's, he has particular reference to unrestrained sexual behavior. And that's the society we live in today. Because in Scripture, the only context, everyone say only, the only context in which sexual activity of any kind is permitted is actually in marriage as God defines marriage, not the latest government trend. And God defines marriage as that union between a man and a woman. Amen? Adam and Eve, not Adam and deep revelation. If you just, I'll let that settle. <laughs> but look, um, that's how God defines marriage. And whether it be homosexual sexual activity or heterosexual sexual activity, whichever one, if it's outside of the context of marriage as God defines it, it is sin. Now, you know, it used to be said, when I do weddings, I say this, you may now give your bride your first lawful kiss. <laughs> because, of course, I know full well they've already kissed. But think about it. In olden days, they would say, you may now kiss the bride. Now, that just makes no sense today. Because you know full well that they've already kissed. And it's just an observation. The point is, is that we're loose. <laughs> All right? This society is loose. And it's become normal. And we have to be careful about jumping on bandwagons. I try not to jump on bandwagons because, you know, the Christians will make a lot of noise about homosexuality and so on. But I'm like, well, listen, all sex outside of marriage is sin, whether that be heterosexual or homosexual. Amen's resounding in here today. You know what I'm like when I hear silence? I'm like, hmm, I need to speak about that more. But listen, sin is sin. And we need to be people who live according to Scripture. Where all sexual activity outside of marriage is fornication. Fornication. Sexual immorality. And listen, there will be many Christians on the day of judgment who will end up in hell. Listen to what Jesus said. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles or wonders in your name? And he will say to them, I don't know you. You who practice lawlessness, depart from me. There are Christians who will end up in hell. Notice what Jesus said to his own disciples. Everyone say, I'm feeling good. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples. He said to them, don't fear those who can kill you, kill your body, and after that do nothing. Because Jesus was a great motivational speaker. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body and after that can't do anything. Fear him whom after he has destroyed your body can throw you into hell. That's how he motivated them. Jesus doesn't make vain threats. Listen, there's a teaching, once saved, all were saved. No, absolutely not. No, Jesus didn't believe that. Paul didn't believe that. Romans 11, he said, listen, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise, he says, you stand, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. That's what Paul said. Jesus warned his own disciples about hell. Why would he do that if they couldn't go there? That would be a waste of time. As a Christian, you can end up in hell. Please understand, if I backslide and I decide to go and live in a manner that I shouldn't, the fact that I've preached to you won't help me. I will end up in hell, and that's forever. It's eternal conscience torment. You are tormented eternally in hell. It's a bad place to be. You don't want to go there. And this is why we are thankful for God's love, because he didn't want us to go there. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, so that if we put our faith in him, we will not perish, but have eternal life. But God is not mocked. Jesus said to one of the churches, we'll be starting Revelation soon as a church. 
in our corporate readings. Well, Jesus said to one church, listen, he who overcomes, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Now, that would be a waste of time saying that unless it were possible that Christians' names could be blotted out of the book of life. And so, listen, we need to all run from sin, recognizing that it is a dangerous, harmful thing to muck around with. We are called to be holy as Christians, which we will look at in just a moment. Now then, he says that not only have they given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness, he says, with greediness. And greediness is the continual desire for more. Now, as Christians, we should not be greedy. Thank God for his blessings, all right? God blesses us with nice things, that's wonderful. But greed is something we shouldn't have. And even preachers today send the wrong message. Listen, if I could go and purchase 5,000 pound trainers, okay? And, you know, there are some very expensive trainers. And these remarkable shoes here, um, they don't cost that much. But listen, if I were, if I could go and purchase a 5,000 pound pair of trainers, I wouldn't be wearing them on Sunday. Because I put a stumbling block in the way of other people. Do you realize there are celebrity preachers who, I mean, there was a whole website dedicated. I haven't been on the website myself. There was a whole website dedicated to the trainers that certain preachers are wearing and showing the price tag of them. And all this does, I remember, you remember, Mark, years ago, we went to see, um, we, meet, we met up with someone when we were going to do a men's health day. And he wasn't a Christian. But he was put off by what he saw other Christians doing. And in terms of the whole prosperity thing. And let me tell you, just because we have a right to do something, that I have a right, if I want to, to go and purchase whatever trainers I want to purchase. Just because I have a right to do it, doesn't mean I should flaunt my wealth on a Sunday and put a stumbling block in front of other people. Because listen... That's saying that, listen, my right to wear those trainers is more important than that person's soul. And in the body of Christ, there is a whole load of greed. Greed. God, as I said it to you before, God help you if on a Sunday morning, I'm coming here trying to raise funds for a private jet. God help you. Nothing, I'm not saying anything's wrong with having a private jet, but listen... When you put stumbling blocks unnecessarily in the way of people, listen, you've lost it. There is greed even in the body of Christ. Greed. So don't be deceived by these preachers who are going to pressure you on, a, on television to send in your $1,000 seed. I mean, I've told you this before. Don't fall for this. I'm going to open my Bible. Let's see where it goes. Job 34, verse 2. Hear my words, you wise men. Give ear to me, you who have knowledge. So, he speaks about wise men. Job 34, verse 2. 34, 2. If you want wisdom, you want to be a wise man, I just feel to do this. Send in your 342-pound seed. Job, I've seen that done on television. These guys, I'm telling you, some of them are crooks. And, you know, 2 Peter warns us about this, about false teachers who will, you know, exploit God's people and make money from them, make merchandise. You don't need to send off for someone's holy water on television. You remember last week I told you about that guy. His name, I think, I won't even mention it. I don't want to, this goes on YouTube. I don't want to be sued. But there was that guy who was doing that whole trickery thing with the earpiece, his wife was in the room reading out people's details from the cards they would fill out. And he had an earpiece in. And then he would be calling out people and he, like, like he's prophesying and telling them their information. That guy, I'm pretty sure it was him. 
I went on his website, and no, it was on TV. He was like selling this holy water. And people who are in vulnerable situations, obviously are going to be like, you know what, I need God to come through for me. And so they will spend their money. There was another guy who used to be a televangelist, and, but he was crooked. But he eventually came clean about his strategies as a televangelist. And he would say, listen, he knew that there was some granny somewhere who had a last pot of savings, and he would intentionally go, you, right there, you know, looking at the camera, you have a pot of savings, and God is saying to you, you need to send that to me. And people will do it. This is reality. And, you know, you've heard me say before, if ever you saw what happens behind the scenes, you would be shocked. This is why I don't encourage people to follow celebrity preachers. You know what? You want a role model? Let it be someone you actually know. Let it be, say there's a couple who've been married for 50 years. You can see the joy in their marriage. Learn from them. You actually know the people. But these guys on TV, you don't know them. They could be wonderful. They could be not. You don't know what they are actually like in real life. Which is why it said, you know, never meet your hero. It's easy to look good from a distance, but when you actually get to know people or even live with people, you see, if you ever live with someone and after living with them, you still respect them, now you know that's someone who's truly respectable. Now, I've gone just a little bit off the um, topic here, so let me come back to the passage. So, he says, thankfully, in the next verse, verse 20, he begins with the word, but. Everyone say, but. But. And after all that scathing description, I think the word but is very helpful here. So he says, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So, in other words, no one who lives in an immoral way can claim that they have been taught by Jesus. No one. It's that simple. He says, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You see, Jesus teaches us to live righteously, and he tells us the truth. And you listen, how do you know if you're really hearing from God? Because a lot of the people say they're hearing from God, and quite frankly, they're not always hearing from God, I can assure you of that. How do you know if you're hearing from God? When was the last time God told you something that you did not want to hear? You see, that's a good sign. If the God that speaks to you only ever tells you what you want to hear, that's probably not God. All right? When you're truly hearing from God, because he's a father who loves you, and when you love someone, you're not going to allow them to just continue going down a path that will destroy them. Okay? God knows about hell. He doesn't want you there. So as a loving father, he will correct you and point you in the way that you should go. And that will mean that you will hear things, unless you're perfect already, you will hear things you don't want to hear. And when that happens, thank God. Thank God that he loves you that much, he will correct you. Now, in the next verse, Paul explains that the truth, well, he explains what this truth is that Jesus tells us to live. And so he says now in verse 22 and 23, he says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, the old man is our old self. It's the way we used to live before we came to Christ. And he says, put that off. Our old self, he says, grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. In other words, deceitful desires. Now, here's an important thing. The, the desires of your flesh, the, your sinful nature, is deceitful. Because sin will make you want to think that you will be happy by following it. And that, you know, if you follow God, then, you know. I mean, remember in the Garden of Eden, where God said to Adam, listen, you can eat of any tree except this one all right the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he said can't eat on that one you'll die on the day you eat of it notice that he said you will die and we'll come back to that in just a moment now what was the temptation that the devil 
gave to Eve. He said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here's the thing. We know that Adam and Eve, you see, how would they have got their knowledge of good and evil? From God. What the devil was tempting them with was that they would be their own source of good and evil. They wouldn't have to go to God. This is why it says about every tree in the garden that it was good to the, behold, it was pleasant to the sight, and it was good for food. That was said of every single tree. But that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when Eve saw it, it says she saw that it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the sight, but there was something added and desirable to make one wise. So the temptation of the devil, you see, and he's very clever because he didn't just tempt Eve for her. You, know, you don't really see this in English. But when the devil said to Eve, you will be like God, the word you in Hebrew is in its plural form, not singular. So in other words, he's saying to her, not just you, you and your husband, you will be like God. You will be able to decide for yourself what is right and wrong. You will be your own source of wisdom. And that's what did it for Eve. She took and she gave it to her husband with her. Now here's the thing. Notice that the temptation was deceitful. It promised much, but God said to Adam, the day you eat of it, you will die. And this is how sin works. It promises much. It promises you that this will be good for you, that this will, you know, bless you as it were. But the moment you do it, you die. And the death being spoken there is probably spiritual death. Because Adam lived till, what, 900 and something years, as you do. But he lived long. But here's the thing, he died in that moment spiritually. And listen, when you have a relationship with God, what sin, sin will just bring death to you. Because your relationship with God now suffers. And you can no longer fellowship with him the way you used to. You won't have confidence to pray. You see, if you want great faith, try living free from sin. Because when you sin, notice, you, it's more difficult to believe God for things. Now, thank God there's forgiveness. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and unjust to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But listen, don't live a life of sin because it will trip you up and the joy it promises will not materialize. The only way to have true and lasting joy is to be in the will of God. That's when you have peace and joy, true joy. It's when you're in the will of God. It has been said, life without God is like a blunt pencil or an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. And you see, what gives us purpose is knowing that we are in the will of God, that we're doing what pleases him. Otherwise, why really are we just existing on this planet? What's the point? God gives us purpose. Now, some will say that as human beings we are just, you know, evolved, whatever, that we're just what you see and nothing more. The problem with that mindset is that what it means is that there is no real meaning of right and wrong. There is no right and wrong if we are just evolved matter. Because where does conscience come from? This is why as a Christian you can be doing, you see, if you are born again, John said this, he said, the person who is born of God doesn't keep on sinning because God's seed remains in him. So when you are truly born again, you cannot keep on living in sin because God won't let you. It will be torment for you. You're not meant to fit in. But if there we are just evolved matter, 
you know, that we, by millions of years of evolution and now we exist as we do, then there is no real right or wrong because we just matter. What we call right or wrong is just evolution. There is no right or wrong. Your truth has no more validity than my truth because we just evolve matter. And so there is no objective moral standard. There's no point to human existence without God. There is no righteousness or wickedness if God does not exist. Because who says that is right and that is wrong? We just evolve matter. That doesn't mean anything, what I think. But we're created in the image of God. And we all have a conscience. And we must listen to it. Never do anything that your conscience troubles you about. You will regret it. It brings death. If you are born again, it brings you death. Believe me, spiritual death. Now then, he then says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, we change the way we think about sin. We change the way we think. This is how we're transformed. We allow God to upgrade our thoughts. And we now, you know, it's like if you've lived on McDonald's, the chicken McNuggets, I mean, back in the day, it used to be the sweet and sour sauce I would, you know, dip that in. I don't know how it tastes these days, but that's what, you know, that was the uh, nice one to me. But anyway, but once you begin to explore being healthy and you want to look after yourself, you no longer desire those things. You've, your mind has been renewed. And the same thing applies spiritually. You, you're, when your mind is renewed, you no longer want to go and live in sin. You want to please God. And this is how you know your mind's renewed. You do what is right because it is right. Not to try and coerce God to blessing you. You do what is right because it's right whether or not there's some tangible blessing you receive. That's how you know your mind is renewed. And we all need to invite God to do that in us. We do what is right because it's right. Now then, he says in the next verse, he continues, which is closely, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Christianity is not simply letting go of the past. It's embracing something new. You put on the new man, which he says is created according to God. In other words, the new self is created in God's likeness. It's created according to God. Now, there is a popular misunderstanding um, about what it means to be like God. Because the Bible says be imitators of God. Okay? And there's a theology that has influenced much of the body of Christ. And it's word of faith theology. And you may or may not have heard of the word of faith movement. Very controversial movement. And I'll say a very dangerous one too. But basically, word of faith theology teaches that because we are like God, we need to speak things into existence. Now this is where it will really begin to hit home because even beyond word of faith settings, this kind of teaching has infiltrated the body of Christ. And so because we are like God, this teaching goes, we are to speak things into existence. Because at the end of the day, God spoke things into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. And so because we are like God, we are to speak things into existence. And it teaches that we are to make what is called positive confessions. And we're not to make bad confessions. So if you are unwell, you're not supposed to say, I'm unwell. 
If anyone asks how you are, you say, I'm healed. Seriously. To say you're unwell is a bad confession. This is really legalistic. Now, what that does basically is just make you a good liar. It's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. This is word of faith theology. Stay well away from it. It's bondage. And it makes Christians liars. Now this is dangerous. Because the moment you start, you have an environment in which saying a lie is normal. You now have a culture that doesn't have integrity. And that's a dangerous thing. And listen, we, listen, you cannot speak anything into existence unless God wants that thing to be in existence. You can confess all day long, but if God isn't doing it, it won't happen. And the body of Christ, I mean, I would have hoped you know, that the pandemic that we've been in should have woken a lot of people up. But, let me tell you, because faith preachers died in that pandemic. Paul, when that storm came, when he was on his way to Rome, and he ended up shipwrecked on the island of Malta, the whole island, the whole island was healed by Paul. I mean, that's crazy. The whole island was healed by Paul. Well, then this same Paul writes to Timothy. And Timothy has been having these stomach problems and some infirmities. And he says, listen, use a little wine. Because in those days, the water supply wasn't like this lovely water here. Um, And so they would use wine to purify the water. He says, use a little wine for your stomach and your frequent infirmities. Notice he didn't say, Timothy, bad confession. Dude, what's wrong with you? By by his stripes, you're healed. Timothy, claim your healing. You notice that? And as we've seen before, that verse, by his stripes, we are healed. And listen, I've, you know, I've been Christian for ages. And so a lot of this stuff I say because I've listened to that preaching too. And, you know, you, you would look to, to these guys and think, you know, they're the guys. They must know what they're talking about. You try and follow and so on. But listen, 1 Peter 2.24, the context is spiritual healing, as we've seen when we looked through the book of 1 Peter. All right? And Paul, that same Paul, I mean, in Ephesus, Handkerchiefs were taken from him and people were healed. But yet he doesn't offer to send Timothy one of his handkerchiefs for a $342 seed. He didn't do it. Why? Here's my point. Paul can do nothing unless God is doing it. Paul himself, he had whatever problem it was. I don't know what the problem was. But he had this thought in the flesh, whatever it was, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, whatever it was, it was bad and he didn't want it. And I've come to realize that in as much as we can make a distinction between persecution and um, sickness and so on, the simple fact of the matter is this. If you have been beaten for Christ, it's the same thing as being sick, for goodness sake. It's the same thing. You're in pain. All right, so whatever it is, Paul didn't want it. This is the same Paul, the whole island of Malta was healed. Cloths were taken from him in Ephesus and healed the sick. Yet this thorn in the flesh is there, and he asked God, take it away from me. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. I think it's the other door you need. Yep, good. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And he doesn't take it away from Paul. Paul can do nothing unless God is doing it. We have, so when it says we're like God, we are not like God in terms of power. Listen, we can only work miracles if God is working the miracle. We have no inherent power. So listen to what he says now. In what sense are we like God? He says, which was created according to God 
in true righteousness and holiness. You see it? We are like God in the moral sense. That's the sense in which we imitate him in being holy and righteous. That's what the new man is now. What is righteousness? Righteousness is simply doing what is right. Now the word holy means separate. Holiness in this context is being separate from sin. That's it. That's the way we are like God. And the moment, you know, some of these teachings in the church that have been going around suggesting that we can have divine health now is nonsense. Because be an observer. The same faith preachers, let me tell you, they get sick. They get sick. They have to get doctors and they die. So don't be misled into thinking. You see, I've called it before an over-realized eschatology where we think we are further ahead in God's program than we are. Divine health is realized in the resurrection. Don't listen to this Pastor Chris guy on Love World Television on you know, the God channels on your sky box. That guy is a false teacher. Run from him. False teacher. This guy was saying when the pandemic started, how it's just 5G. And people still follow these guys. Run from those guys. He has his own channel, run from him. He teaches his people that they can live in divine health now. You can't. We all have corruptible bodies that will die. Every one of us. And I say this, I know it's probably not the nicest thing to hear, but wake up, we are all dying. And what we can do, you see, I've mentioned before, you can't see it from there. But look, I've noticed a good number of, not even grey, white hairs in my beard. I mean, they don't even go grey for it, white. What does it mean? I'm dying. And I don't, listen, why, why should I not be comfortable saying that? I know where I'm going. For goodness sake, I've got the gift of eternal life. My goal is not to live to 120. Why? Why would I want to do that? When my, my work here is done, I'm gone, hopefully. I don't want, I mean, listen, there's things like, I like basketball. But I don't really, really want to be spending all my time watching basketball or take up some new hobby when I could be with the Lord. <laughs> listen. Anyway, let, let me just continue this message because I'm mindful. I don't even know what the time is. So look, God has called us to be righteous and holy. So what does putting off the old self and putting on the new self look like practically? Ephesians 4.25. And this will be a good opportunity to send in your 425 seed in UK pounds to um, joycommunitychurch.co.uk just releasing favour. <laughs> that was sarcasm, by the way. I'm sure you know that. Now, he says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak what? Truth with his neighbour. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Now, look. We are not to lie as Christians, amen? We are not to lie. Nor are we to allow anger to get the better of us. It's inevitable that we will feel angry. That's why I said be angry. We will feel anger, but we are not to let it control us. We are to have self-control. And, you know, if you find yourself really struggling, you're, you're, you know, you're just full of rage, because there are things that will anger you, all right? Bring it to God. Be real with him. Let him know how you're feeling. Don't pretend you're feeling in some way that you're not. Be real with God. He already knows. But do not let the sun go down on your anger, he says. So, now, one view is that that's a proverbial kind of statement. But others might view it literally. I don't know which. But the point is clear. We need to deal with it as promptly as we can. That's the point. 
All right? Deal with anger as promptly as you possibly can. Don't let it find a home in you. Ask for God's help. Then he also says, nor give place to the devil. Now, this is so important. Whenever we sin, and it may be that he's thinking in particular about what he just mentioned, anger. It could be broader than that. Who knows? I'd imagine it's the anger that he primarily has in, ha- in mind. But whenever we sin, we give up ground to the devil. You give the devil an inroad into your life whenever you sin. Or when you harbor emotions and thoughts that you should not, you are giving him an inroad and he's not your friend. He's not there to bless you, believe you me. So give no place to the devil, he says. Then in the next verse, Ephesians 4.28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Now, I trust we all know that stealing is wrong, okay? But he says, the person who used to steal should stop. Then he also tells us, listen, this verse shows us, as far as I understand it, the type of work we should do and the reason for earning money. He says, work, labor with your hands, he says, working with his hands what is good. So whatever we do for a living should not be morally questionable. Okay? But also, you see, the NIV translates it as doing something useful. And so it could be used here in the sense of something beneficial. And so Christians should earn a living by doing something that is in some way helpful to other people. So whether that be a provision of um, food or clothing like Mark's wonderful shop, you know about the shop in Leighton Buzzard, Wild at Heart menswear, is providing something, and women's wear, thank you, Nikki. Yeah, they've got women's wear as well. Leighton Buzzard, Wild at Heart, Men's wear and women's wear, but whatever, you'll find it, Google it. Now, providing clothing, food, or it could be providing a service, whether it be healthcare, education, cleaning, hairdressing, um, fixing appliances, whatever it is, it's something useful, not some scam. You know, I've, I've released a book called How to Get Rich Quick. And in the book, what it will tell you is, this is how you get rich quick. Write a book called How to Get Rich Quick. Oh, the wisdom you guys get when you come to Joy Community Church. But listen, I mean, there's some useless things out there, okay? Some scams, some ridiculous things, okay? We don't want to um, get caught up with that. That's, we, we're to do something good, amen? Something useful, honest work. Now, watch this. The purpose of earning money is not just to meet your needs. He says that he may have something to give him who has need. You see? So God blesses us to be a blessing. Yes, to meet our needs as well, but also so that we can be a blessing to other people. Now, Paul continues in verse 29 to 30. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So our speech should be free of things such as inappropriate jokes, slander, gossip, and foul language. Okay? Um, Expletives should not be found on the lips of Christians. Our words should be good words that build people up, that bring encouragement. Furthermore, we must be aware that our words and conduct can grieve, it says, the Holy Spirit. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're sealed of the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. That's the day when Jesus comes. And the seal is God's mark on us, marking us as God's property. Now, In the final two verses of our passage, Paul wrote this, verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, everyone say all. So in other words, these things, listen, they're not to be tolerated in our lives even a little bit. All bitterness, he says, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 
So bitterness, you know, that is wrath, anger, clamor, loud quarreling, that refers to evil speaking, so that probably it might refer to slander, okay, where you say something bad about someone damaging their reputation and it's a false statement about them. Um, he says, listen, with all malice, that's evil intention towards others. We should only desire good for people, never bad. And then he says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ in God, forget, or God in Christ forgave you. Now, here's what I want you to imagine as we close. Just imagine a human being who is kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Imagine that person. It actually sounds kind of like Jesus. Kind, tender-hearted, that means basically where you are sympathetic to the needs of others. And forgiving. Now that would be an amazing person to be around and to have as a friend. And that's the person that God has called every one of us to be. What has God called you to do? To be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. And so with those words, I will now close this message and I will now give the summary. So, first of all, we should not follow the crowd. We must never get to the point where we can no longer feel our conscience convicting us of sin. According to the Bible, the only context in which sexual activity should take place is in marriage as defined by God. Sinful desires are deceitful. Following them will rob you of the lasting joy that can, be, that can only be found in Jesus. We need to allow God to change the way we think about sin. God has called you to be someone who does what is right and is separate from all that is evil. It is inevitable that at times we will feel angry. But we must not allow anger to get the better of us. We should deal with anger as promptly as we can. Whenever we sin, whenever we harbor emotions that we should not have, we surrender ground to the devil and allow him an inroad into our lives. Whatever we do for a living, it should be something good. The purpose of earning money is not only to meet our needs. We are blessed to be a blessing. Our speech should be pure. We should ensure we don't grieve the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Things such as bitterness, wrath, anger, loud quarreling, slander, malice should not be in our lives. Instead, we are to be kind, sympathetic to the needs of others, and forgiving. Bow your heads with me, please, as I pray.